Yeah, so I'm going to speak today about the crypto economics of retrieval. It's Crypto Economics Day, and there is definitely a huge intersection between what we look at in retrieval markets and some of the amazing stuff which the team at Crypto Econ uh, are working on. And I've got a spaceman here, I guess we've just heard a lot about IPFS going to space, and he's just looking to retrieve some stuff. He's just looking out, and he just wants to retrieve some data. Okay, so I actually spoke at the Crypto Econ Day in Amsterdam in April. So I'm going to start with a recap of what I spoke about there, but I'm going to try not to cover too much of the same material because it's all on YouTube. And then I'm actually not going to introduce the rest of the sections yet because I think it doesn't really make sense to yet. Okay, so for the recap, um, firstly, what is a retrieval market? A retrieval market is a setting in which entities, people, nodes, they can, they can come together and they can provide their services uh, to create fast and perfor performant, reliable economic retrievals of data to those who are requesting them. And essentially, they are forming a decentralized CDN uh, around the Farcoin network. And so CDNs that you may have heard of, CloudFront, Cloudflare, Akamai, those are the traditional ones. Uh, we're focusing here really on decentralized CDNs. And when we talk about decentralized CDNs, if you spend a little bit of time thinking about what sort of building blocks might con constitute such a CDN, it uh, immediately breaks down into lots of different parts. Um, and these are the kind of things we look at in the retrieval markets group. Uh, I'm not going to go through them now because we haven't got enough time. But we'll focus on crypto economics, obviously. At the end of my previous talk, we ended on this diagram. And there's a link to the previous talk uh, in this slide. Um, but since watching one of Juan's more recent presentations, he actually expressed the diagram in a much tidier way. So I have his, his diagram is on the right. And I've taken that and sort of turned it into my theme. And I'm going to talk through this diagram quickly because I think it's really important to understand this in terms of what we're going to talk about today. So top left, we've got the content publishers, sometimes called storage clients. They're the people who want to actually store data in the Filecoin network. And they give their data to deal and distribution services such as Estuary, uh, such as NFT or storage, sometimes called aggregation services, some also fill mine. And, uh, and then these, these aggregators, they store it in storage providers. The storage providers can also create indexes, which will live in the index nodes, index provider nodes, as given in red here. And that's, a, that's the storage flow of the network. Then we've got the retrieval flow. So down bottom left in yellow, we've got the retrieval clients who are looking to fetch stuff into their browsers or into their, their game consoles, uh, their video streaming platforms. And they want to talk to retrieval providers to have a really good experience retrieving that data. And the retrieval providers, hopefully they have it stored in their cache. And if not, they can cache miss to a storage provider and they can even look up where it is from the indexer nodes. So this is at the moment, sort of a representation of the storage and retrieval of the Filecoin network. Oh, sorry. Did you, <laughs> I'll go back quickly. There you go. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> OK, so we're now going to talk about retrieval provider incentives. Uh, in this previous diagram, I'll go back again, actually, now. <laughs> um, what will cause a retrieval provider to actually join the network and contribute their resources? They have to be incentivized to do so. We've heard a bit about impact evaluators from Juan as well, uh, so we could sort of frame it in that way, although I'm not prepared to do so quite yet. Um, so yeah, what are the incentives to get a retrieval provider to enter the retrieval market? So we're going to begin by a really naive retrieval protocol. And this is where we have the retrieval client on the left who wants to fetch a file from the retrieval provider. And quite simply, they make a Filecoin transaction. And then once the retrieval provider has re received that transaction, it returns the file. Now, this is a very, very simple protocol. And it's even more simple than anything that's in the Filecoin network. It's just a kind of, if you were really thinking out loud about how this would work, you could say, OK, the retrieval provider wants to do this because it's going to earn some Filecoin for this protocol. But I've written out a few constraints on this. Firstly, the retrieval client must have a Filecoin wallet to be able to pay 
uh, and some Filecoin in order to pay the provider. Uh, and secondly, it must know how much that uh, the retrieval provider wants for that, for the transfer. It needs to know the cost of this file. And then we've also got the problem that a fi Filecoin transaction takes a while to reach finality on chain. So we've got some technical problems which we can try and optimize as well. The, all these things we can improve. We already have improved the time that it takes to set up payment channels and exchange vouchers and do these things in the primary, uh, primary retrieval market uh, against storage providers as I spoke about in the previous talk. But there's more, apart, aside from the technical things we can improve, there's sort of an initial product question, which is, will re retrieval clients actually pay directly for retrievals? Whenever we use our browsers, we don't pay to retrieve files, we don't pay to fetch websites. The, business, the Web2 business model is not predicated on the fact that you're gonna pay microtransactions for every single file retrieval. So I think that's a great place to start. And I've started this decision tree which we're gonna build throughout this talk. Uh, and the first question we ask is, should the retrieval client pay directly for the retrieval? And so that brings us to the next section. So yeah, we've got the decision tree and we've got the very simple protocol uh, diagrams here. And there are some use cases for when a retrieval client might pay directly for a retrieval. Uh, perhaps if we want to incentivize index providers to join the network around the world, we could pay for indexes with microtransactions, or paying a reputation provider, or an L1 cache node in a CDN paying an L2 cache node. All these are server-to-server -server retrievals, so it's much easier for the retrieval client to have a wallet set up, to have a Filecoin balance, and to make these micropayments. The last use case I put is Web3 browser retrievals, and there's a question mark at the end because this is what we're really wondering about. Will people be happy to attach a wallet to their browser and start paying micropayments for retrievals. Before we go on to, to kind of the, the yes side of the decision tree, um, or, uh, sorry, sorry, some examples of it, there are some benefits to uh, this direct payment of retrievals. It's a very simple economic model, and each retrieval is settled between the retrieval client and the retrieval provider. So you don't, you don't have to have any third party arbitrate over this. Uh, it's exactly how the retrievals work from storage providers at the moment, this optimistic fair exchange protocol. And because it's so simple, it reduces lots of attack vectors that you might see on the system. Uh, there's a cost to actually retrieving a file, so the retrieval client isn't going to make any retrievals it doesn't mean to, it's not going to do a Sybil attack or a DDoS attack on a retrieval provider because of the cost of a retrieval. So in the retrieval market working group, we've seen a few teams start to work on this side of the decision tree where you're paying for retrievals. The first team is Magmo. Uh, they are building scalable multi-hop payment channels. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide to actually look at a diagram of what they're working on. So on the left-hand side, we've got retrieval clients who have to make payment channels to storage providers in order to retrieve a file in the current Filecoin setup. But this has to be pairwise between a retrieval client and a storage provider. So that's a lot of payment channels. And also, if you want to retrieve something from a storage provider from whom you haven't retrieved something from before, you have to set that up, which is an on-chain transaction, and it adds a lot of latency to your retrieval. So Magma are working on this setup on the right, whereby every client can connect to what I've called a hop hub, although they don't use that term, it just was quite short for the diagram. Um, so they connect with a payment channel to a hop hub, and then we have all the hop hubs have a kind of completely connected web with their payment channels between them, and then a payment channel between each storage provider and a hop hub. And then what, can, what they, you can do is create these virtual channels between retrieval clients and storage providers, and once you exchange vouchers on the virtual channel, you can then reconcile what's been exchanged across the three hops between those two nodes. And this means you don't have to create a new payment channel every time someone wants to retrieve from a new storage provider. We also have Myel. They're working on a very symmetric peer-to-peer -peer retrieval network for when the client pays. Their philosophy, although I don't want to put words into their mouth, is that they want to see a paradigm shift for Web3 where it really is about people paying microtransactions from their browser or from whatever their retrieval clients are. And having a truly symmetric peer-to-peer -peer network where you, n you don't have any notion of clients and servers really, it's just everyone's helping each other out um, and acting both as a client and a server. 
So there's some really interesting work there, and it's leveraging a lot of the protocol lab stack. There's also loads of opportunities. So leaning on the Magmo work of multi-hot payment channels and uh, on the work of Ken Labs, who have built Pando, and the protocol labs team who have built the indexer node, we could come up with some proposals for how we can do these micropayments to incentivize people to run these, I guess, off-chain services in the network. And more generally, the hot pubs, which you spoke about, or ceiling as a service, or any of these other what I call off-chain services, we could look at how we can incentivize them to join the network through these off-chain microtransactions. We've also got the opportunity for a proposal for how best to pay for a retrieval from, from a browser. Uh, there's obviously security concerns once you start to have a wallet in a browser. So how best can we have a Filecoin wallet in a browser? How best can we manage those microtransactions? What's the UX flow uh, of, of such a uh, solution? And also something I mentioned earlier, a proposal for how a client wouldn't even know how much to pay for a retrieval. Uh, we, these retrievals, we want them to be very, very quick. And if you're having to find out how much a deal costs before you even start retrieving the file, it's an extra round trip, it's a bit more latency. So proposals around how we can not lose the speed we want, uh, but also find out these, this kind of metadata around a retrieval deal. Uh, from the retrieval client. So yeah, loads of opportunities in this the client directly pays side of the decision tree. We now move to the other side of the decision tree. Uh, so follow it in yellow, and we're now going down the no side. So the retrieval client is now not going to pay directly for the retrieval. And this means that I've had to zoom out to the original overall diagram of the Filecoin network. Because we're now saying, if the retrieval client is not going to pay, then who is going to pay? And the first thing is, OK, perhaps we could have block rewards for retrieval. Uh, perhaps these retrieval providers could prove that they are serving retrievals. Uh, Irene spoke about it in, in the last talk um, and showed that there were some impossibility results about proofs of delivery or proofs of retrieval. But supposing we could, perhaps there could be block rewards. I think going down that path is a bit dangerous, and so I think for this talk, we're not gonna go in that direction. I think what we have to really find is an underlying economic model whereby value is flowing around the network to retrieval providers without us having to sort of build it into a block reward. And so what we end up doing is leaning on the Web2 model whereby the content publishers, the storage clients, they're the ones who want to store the data, and they're the ones who want to have that data accelerated by a CDN. To, their, to the retrieval clients. And so we can see this, this kind of squirrely green line to show that we need value to transfer between those two parts of the network, but we're not quite sure how yet. The, from now on as well, the white arrows are how data's flowing, and the green arrows is how tokens are flowing around the network. So yeah, we've got these retrieval providers who are serving retrievals, and we need to then prove to the content publishers, or to, I guess, some other node in the network, there could be an intermediary, what sort of service they've provided. And the service can be measured in a few ways. And I guess this, again, leads back to the impact evaluator stuff, like what should we be measuring to, to measure how performant a retrieval provider is? Um, the two things that really come to mind, and what we're thinking about it more and more with the Saturn team and with other teams is, simply a measure of how many retrievals have been served, and also how, how fast those retrievals have been served. So basically, I think what people in the industry say, how much bandwidth has been shared uh, from these retrieval providers. However, as we saw on the other side, when the client pays, it's a very secure process where there's a responsibility on the retrieval client to pay for it, and thus the attack vectors shrink. Here we're opening up loads of different attack vectors on the network where people can try and find ways to prove that they've served retrievals that perhaps they haven't, which we'll see in a second. So to build the decision tree out a little bit further, we're now saying that the retrieval client is not gonna pay directly for the retrieval. And now the second question we ask is, how does each retrieval provider prove its contribution to whoever's going to be uh, footing the bill? And that brings us on to Saturn. Um, and we've got Ansgar in the audience here tech lead for Saturn. Um, thank, you for, thank you for joining. Um, <laughs> so Saturn is in this camp of the retrieval client doesn't pay. 
And the idea here is that the retrieval providers, they will serve retrievals to the clients and they are going to self-report what they've been up to. They're going to send logs. Uh, you can see the, the white arrow saying logs on it. They're going to be sending logs of each retrieval to the Saturn orchestrator. Uh, who's going, and then the Saturn orchestrator is going to be aggregating over those logs and it's going to decide how much each retrieval provider should be rewarded for, for their service. And the Saturn orchestrator on the other side is going to be taking tokens or value in from the content publisher either via the deal and distribution service or perhaps directly and managing the, the market that way. But I'm sure everyone is already thinking that that's, you know, there's some pretty obvious attack vectors here. Why wouldn't a retrieval provider just create loads of logs which uh, didn't even happen? Um, or perhaps they might collude with a retrieval client and say, why didn't you retrieve this file a thousand times? Or they might spin up a whole bunch of different retrieval clients and do a Sybil attack and say, right, we're going to pretend that we've got all of this activity going. We've done all these retrievals. And so we are beginning some work with the crypto econ team with Maria, who's recently joined. She's going to be looking at fraud detection uh, on this log, uh, this logs database, and understanding exactly what is a normal sort of level of activity for these nodes that are spread around the world, and what's an abnormal uh, level of activity. And I think we're going to get some really interesting insights out of that. And that's that fraud detection module that I've added to the Saturn orchestrator. Two minutes left, okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to have to be really quick then. There's quite a lot to go through, um, getting carried away. So there's also this other approach where, which a lot of other teams have reached for, Titan, Meson, Media, and the CryptoNet Lab uh, with the Retrievability Oracle, I think it's now called the uh, Retrievability Oracle DAO, where we have these validator nodes, which are also known as hunters or guards or auditors uh, or referees, who are going to be making retrievals against the retrieval provider and testing that they are serving what they should be serving. Uh, and then reporting that back either to a centralized hub, to a smart contract, or to a DAO uh, in order to penalize those nodes or reward them based on their performance. And then it's the old question of who will guard the guards. Who, how do we know the validators are acting uh, appropriately? Uh, we saw Irene describe a way that they're going to do that as part of a DAO. Uh, but there are obviously those questions that have to be asked and different attack vectors come up in the system. So this is the overall decision tree that we've built. We've seen teams working in all different spaces based on, I guess, what I've tried to simplify into this diagram uh, and these particular questions. And I'll finish up by just saying there are a few opportunities uh, for teams who want to get into the retrieval market space. One is using self-sovereign identity and DIDs and verifiable credentials as a way for the sort of get this middle ground between the retrieval client not paying and paying by actually signing and issuing verifiable credentials to retrieval providers and then building up a sort of reputation around their decentralized identity uh, in order to have a, have a, and then we have to have a mechanism for re rewarding someone based on how many verifiable credentials they've gathered from different clients. And there's also loads of opportunities around how we can manage the quantity of transactions. For example, let's say Saturn, which will start off centralized. Let's say it moved to a smart contract. We've got a record for every single tr retrieval in the network. And we're going to have to look at ways we can manage that the, the sheer number of transactions we're going to face there, either with hierarchical consensus or roll-ups. And there's also opportunities around how we could use probabilistic payments and credit networks to reduce the number of transactions we have to record on the ledger. I won't go into definitions of those now. And just to say, there are open positions on the Retrieval Market team and on the Saturn team. Head to retrieval.market to find out more or scan that QR code or head to the Retrieval Market Filecoin Slack to find out more as well.